well fed two ways. And usually when I'm well fed, I want to go sleep. <laughs> but if you'll just give me a, a few minutes tonight. I am delighted to be here. Uh, I love Brother Scott. I refer to him as the Israelite in whom there is no guile. He's not trying to hide anything. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, we learn that he has a people. We learn that they are not every person in the world, nor are they of the world, but they are in the world. And all through this chapter of Scripture, if we didn't find it anywhere else, we'd have to know that this is true. God has a people. In verse 2 it says, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. The Father gave him a people, gave him a body of people, gave him a bride, and gave him the responsibility for those people. Look down here also in verse 6. He says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Verse 11, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Verse 14, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And remembering what has already been said by Brother Bill and each one of these brothers, remembering that sanctify has to do with separating or setting apart. Look at what he says in verse 17. <clears throat> Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. How does he say? He says sanctify or separate them. This is his prayer to the Father, which was surely heard. And he says to the Father, sanctify them how? Through the word of truth. And look down at verse 19. He says, For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. What distinguishes God's elect? I tell you, if you ask a million people 
most likely you'll get a million answers. And most every one of them will be wrong. Men, according to their own religious and various leanings, will give their idea of what distinguishes God's people, or as they say, what a real Christian is. And they say things like, those who have prayed a sinner's prayer, those who accept or just believe Jesus, or those who make a decision, or those who have been baptized, or those who are have joined a church, usually our church. But most of them will connect them to some kind of morality, some work that they think is righteousness, some work of charity, some characteristic of the flesh, or some things that have been done by them. Or either they say something like this. They're a real Christian because they won't do some things. They don't, a real Christian won't smoke. A real Christian won't drink. A real Christian won't do any of these things. But the trouble is... If we open the Bible and we see a multitude of people there who were real Christians, most everything that a real Christian won't do, I can show you where a real Christian has done. Just about everything you can imagine. So what does characterize and what does distinguish this people that Christ is talking about here? Christ says that they are sanctified or they are set apart, they are distinguished by the word of truth. And so the bottom line is they are set apart and distinguished God using this method, not by what they do, but by what they believe. What they believe. And God brings them in his purpose and providence, he brings them to hear the true gospel and believe it. Believe on the Christ of the word. And he's done some miraculous things accomplishing that. He's brought about uprisings in countries where people were sent forcibly to another country and driven right in the arms of the gospel. It's always that way, and they are always distinguished by this very thing. Turn over to the book of Colossians, chapter 1, and listen to what it says. Colossians 1 and verse 3, Paul says, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. We found out about you. We have hope for you and we pray for you because we understand that you have now been brought to believe and you've heard the gospel. 
And he says here that this gospel is good news. It is the glad tidings for some sinners because God has caused them. He's distinguished them by causing them to hear. Faith comes by hearing and be, and uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And notice here what it says here that they heard. It had something to do with a hope that was laid up in heaven for them. It was a hope already accomplished. It was a hope based on the work of another and not anything that they had done. So what Paul is saying here is not only that, but he says the word of the truth is the gospel. Everybody preaches the gospel, don't they? Not the gospel. There are so many that preach another gospel, but their gospel always points to hopes that are created or carried out or based on something that they do, not on what is already done and laid up in heaven for them, which is the word of the truth. That's where hope comes from. God-given hope is hope in Christ because of who he is and because what he has accomplished on behalf of this people and therefore they have a real reason to have hope. Turn over to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. <clears throat> Look first at 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 4. Here the Apostle Paul claims to know some of the elect of God. He knows some of these people that Christ is talking about in John 17 and therefore he writes to them this epistle and he says this in chapter 1 and verse 4. He says, Knowing brethren beloved, your election of God. You say, you can't know the elect of God. Mm, I beg your pardon. He didn't come to this by revelation of the Spirit of God saying, that was my elect and that one's my elect and various ways like that. He came to this conclusion for this. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake, and ye became followers of us. Now, there are always the, those people that say, I don't follow any man. I'm telling you what, if he's preaching the gospel, so far as he's preaching the gospel, you better follow him because if you don't, you're not a follower of the Lamb. Amen. We don't follow men because of their opinions and because of their works or any other thing, but we follow them for their message. If they have the word of God, if they know the gospel and preach the gospel, we follow them. He says, so that ye were examples to all that believe <coughs> in Macedonia and Acacia, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord. They heard the word of the Lord. They believed it. They proclaimed it. He says, not only in Macedonia and Acacia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. How do they know, how does Paul know that these who really heard the gospel, who really believed the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and Him crucified, how did he know 
that they really believe the gospel. He says, and how ye turned to God from idols. We only hear about and can know about the true and living God so as to turn from all the man-made idols in this world by hearing the true gospel. How ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. Because God, in his infinite wisdom, is not only using the gospel to distinguish his people from among men, he's using that gospel to distinguish himself. He is, as he says he is, in his word, in his written word. I hear people all the time saying, well, this is how I feel about it, or this is what I think about it. It does not matter one iota what you think about it. You cannot take God like a piece of silly putty and make him and fashion him in the way that you want. He is, and he always has been, the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. Turn over to Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul has been talking about those who are virtually reprobate. Those who receive not the love of the truth. Those that he sends strong delusion unto. And then he gives in verse 13 one of those tremendously wonderful words of grace. But. But. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. You're distinctive. You're distinguished. Set apart by God. He says, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Not to opportunity. Not to give you a chance. But he's chosen you unto salvation. But notice what he says. Through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. You see, God's Spirit sets apart His elect and causes them to believe the truth. Everybody claims to believe the truth. He says, where unto he called you by our gospel. Now I'm going to tell you something tonight. When Paul says our gospel, he's not talking about their gospel. Our gospel is distinctive in the fact that it originated with God himself, and he gives it in his word. Paul says, I certify unto you that my gospel did not come even from these apostles, but from God himself. It doesn't honor man. It does not glorify him anyway. It does not depend on him. It's God's gospel. And Paul said it is our gospel where until he called you by our gospel to obtaining, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is the glory 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, certainly the glory of Christ has to do with who he is, which there's surely an attack on that in these days. The glory of Christ has to do with what he's done. But the glory of Christ mostly has to do with what he's accomplished. What he has accomplished. You see, if we don't preach a gospel wherein it sets forth Christ as having already accomplished the salvation of his people, we don't have a gospel. Because if it depends on you, in one jot or one tittle, if all you have to do is finish it off, if it's like a picture when an artist has done all the work and all you have to do is just walk up and put one brush stroke on it, you'll mess it up because you're sinners. Scott was just showing me his hand he, where he had got some dye on it. I won't tell you how he got the dye on it, but he, he got some dye on it. Well, sin is like uh, being a sinner and total depravity, as we call it, is a lot like when I used to have this one copy machine and I had to change the toner cartridge in it. And be as careful as I could invariably I was going to get some of that toner on my fingers. And the problem was everything I touched had my fingerprints on it. If your salvation or if your gospel has any of your fingerprints on it whatsoever, it's not God's gospel. And it can't be good news to you. It can't be glad tidings to any sinner who has to finish it or accomplish it and, or do any of these things like this. I want you to listen and or look with me in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 is like a it's like a vegetable garden where everything is just beautiful flower garden which is just take your breath but when Paul talks about trusting Christ and believing on Christ look at what he says here in Ephesians 1 beginning in verse 12 he says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ in whom ye also trusted. You see that word after there? Not before, not apart from, in whom ye trusted after that ye heard the word of truth. Now I was raised up in a Southern Baptist church. I I heard more sermons than I even want to remember I heard. I was like Brother Scott Richardson. That, that's just a little bit too much religion for me. And I had one of those Sunday school pens where you look like a third world general. You've been so faithful and everything like that. But I never heard the word of truth. The preacher was having problems with his wife and I heard a lot of sermons on how a wife is, submit, is to submit to her husband. <laughs> but I didn't hear the word of truth. You say, well, how, how do you know you didn't hear the word of the truth? He says this, after that you heard the word, the word of truth, what's, what's going to follow now? What is the word of truth? The gospel of your salvation. I heard the gospel of how to be saved. Come to the front, pray a sinner's prayer. 
I heard all kinds of gospels of how to be saved, but I never heard the gospel of my salvation, the gospel that reveals that Christ had already saved me. He wasn't making me savable. He wasn't giving me a chance or an opportunity or even an invitation or an offer. He had saved me. That's what he was doing on the cross. And I heard one day the word of truth. I wasn't looking for it. I didn't deserve to hear it. If left up to me, I'd have never heard it. I'd have rejected it every day, but because God had chosen me in Christ in old eternity to be gracious and merciful to me, He caused me to hear it. He sent somebody with the gospel, with the word of truth, and it was the gospel of my salvation. In whom after that ye believe, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. He says all of this took place. You believe, you trusted. After that you heard the word of truth. You didn't, you weren't saved. You didn't trust the true Christ when you were hearing all the lies and all the misrepresentations about God, you weren't, you weren't saved in those old Ar Arminian things. You weren't saved under those messages. I don't care what you say. The God of truth does not use lies. He sets his people apart. He distinguishes them. And rather than glory in what they once believed, they repent of that which they believed. Paul said it like this. He said, I was before a blasphemer. And the most religionists in our day, they couldn't hold a candle religiously or zealously or morally or with understand, uh, knowledge of the script, they couldn't hold a candle to this man Saul of Tarsus. But he said, when I heard the truth, when I met the true Christ, I found out that I was before a blasphemer, injurious, doing everything I did in the ignorance of unbelief. You cannot believe the truth and you cannot surely believe on Christ. He said, until God sends you the gospel and before that, the object of true faith you know nothing about. Nothing about. Titus, I believe it is, Paul writes to him and he says something like this. And I'll never forget the first time I heard a brother preach on this. He says, God has saved us and called us. That's not what religion says. Religion says God calls you, and if you respond to his call, he'll save you. But the gospel of your salvation has to do with this, that God has saved us and he calls us. <laughs> he said it was like somebody going down to the bank and paying off your note and then picking up the phone and dialing your number and say, hey, I got good news for you. <laughs> That's right. That's why the gospel is good news. That's why the word of truth sets him apart of his own will begot he us with the word of truth. And it always has to do with Christ who is the truth. And it always involves the truth about him. 
and the truth about what he accomplished. That's what Christ came to do. That's what he's doing on the cross. That's what he's doing in his death. He's saving his people. I like to read over then the Song of Solomon. I'm a bit of a, I know I don't look it, but I'm sort of a romantic fella. <laughs> oh, my wife's not watching this. <laughs> but the bride says there, she said, is this the voice of my beloved? She's all around this garden and everything. And then all of a sudden, there's a voice, there are words spoken, and she says, it's the voice of my beloved. I think I experienced that. When I heard the truth, nothing ever satisfied, nothing ever gave me peace. I was a preacher, and I, I, I not only didn't have peace myself, I couldn't preach peace to anybody. But when I heard the voice of my beloved, I knew it was my beloved. I knew he was talking to me. I found out my name was written in heaven. How do you know that? Well, if he if he'd said in this book, if your name is written in heaven, you know it's written in this book. Amen. But if I if I had read these promises and they said well, Christ died for Gary Shepherd. If Christ died for and accomplished the salvation of Gary Shepherd, I'd say, oh boy, oh no. It might be that one that used to be on ABC News. But when he said Christ died for sinners, when he said he died for the ungodly, he was talking my language. He was calling my name. And so he says, the bride says, she recognizes his particular voice. It's the voice of my beloved. Christ is the Father's beloved, and he's also the beloved of his people. It's obvious in these texts of Scripture that his voice was recognized and delighted in. The same thing is true in John chapter 10. You know what it is. Some of you do. John chapter 10. Christ has just been teaching and speaking among a lot of religious people. And they've rejected his words. He gives them the reason. Verse 26, he says, But ye believe not, because you are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. You don't, you haven't believed in, he's not saying you haven't believed and therefore you can't be my sheep. He says the reason that you have not believed is because you're not of my sheep. Why? How do you know that? My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. The sheep hear the voice of the shepherd. <coughs> they hear the word of truth. I fully believe that one of the first, if not the first, evidences of the new birth in an individual is that God puts in them a regard for the truth. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you right now, I believe that's what the new heart is, the heart of faith. What do we believe? What can we believe? I don't say that if at the first we always understand it. 
but we're brought immediately into that position where I, I, maybe I don't understand it all, but if God said it, that's it. Religion likes to say, God said it, and I believe it, that settles it. No. If God said it, that settles it. If he gives you grace to believe it, you're one of his sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. When do they hear? When God gives them the ears of faith because they're spiritually dead, and he gives them the spiritual ear. The hearing ear is of the Lord. He that hath an ear, let him hear. That's seven times in the book of Revelation. He that hath an ear, let him hear. What? What the Spirit saith to the churches. What does the Spirit of God say to the churches? Well, Christ said the Spirit of God will take the things of mine and show them to you. He'll show you all those things that are freely given you in Christ. There's a multitude of preachers out there who've never known the joy of that. And many more people who've never experienced the hearing of those things that are freely given to us in Christ. Freely. He speaks to us he sanctifies us. He sets apart His people by speaking to them through the written word, the gospel of Christ crucified. Now, I might as well be honest with you. I don't really like the statement, salvation's in a person. You say, but it is. Yes and no. It's not in some kind of mystical Jesus or undistinguished Christ. Salvation is in that person who because he was that person and because it was God's purpose to did the work upon which our salvation is based. He brought in everlasting righteousness. They say, let's don't talk about doctrine. Let's do. They say, it's dead and it's dry. God says, my doctrine is like the dew. <laughs> I never found anything dry about the dew. But just as the dew sovereignly falls wherever God purposes it to fall, so the gospel and the work of God's Spirit giving life and faith to believe what is preached. I've got to hurry. John eight forty seven. He that is of God. What does that mean? Well, he that is loved of God. He that is chosen of God. He that is redeemed of God. He that is born of God. What does he do? He quit smoking. No. He don't go to the bars anymore. No. He does good works anymore. I tell you, everything that false religion sets as the work that distinguishes God's people, every bit of it can be counterfeited. Morality, 
Men can be clean as a hound's tooth, as we say. They can be sincere. They can be sacrificing. But apart from God's grace, they can't believe the truth. They can't believe the truth. I don't care what Billy Graham said about believing be the easiest thing. It's like falling off a log. No. It's so hard that you'll never do it apart from the grace of God. You believe anything. And if he sends strong delusion, I mean anything. You religious even look at people in our day and they say, how does anybody believe that? The same way you believe the other. It's all the same. But you don't believe the truth. Christ said, his sheep, they won't hear the voice of a stranger. Not when he makes them alive, they won't. Not when he gives them ears to hear, they won't. Not when he gives them faith, they won't. They can't stand it. And this is another obvious thing. Those who are following the voices of strangers are not believers. They've had funny feelings. They, they're sincere. They have a zeal of God for God. But it's not according to knowledge. Well, how do you know they haven't heard? How do you know they don't believe? Well, they're still going about trying to establish their own righteousness. And they've not submitted themselves. Isn't it a strange choice of words he gives there? They have not submitted themselves, bowed to the righteousness of God in Christ. They've never heard the voice of the shepherd. I've got a young man right now that I, a friend that I love, I love, I just love him. And he will, whatever I say almost, he will be in agreement with me in the things of the gospel. But he's still following the voice of a stranger. And that stranger, I'm afraid, is his wife. Mm -hmm. they can't hear the shepherd they don't love him because they don't love his voice they've not been separated from the goats in this way of sanctification and separation by the word of truth And I know, I've tried in my mind to make every allowance for this fellow. I think that much of him. It comes in my mind, well, he may be this, maybe that. No. You see, the word of truth is telling me I must believe that if he's not a follower of Christ, if he don't if he doesn't identify with the truth, he must not be of the truth. Those who do not hear, those who do not believe, those who do not follow the voice of Jesus Christ do not hear God. He said, this is my beloved son. Hear him. And not only that, but more, they do not hear the prophet's sin of God. 
They do not hear the apostle's sin of God. They don't hear true gospel preacher's sin of God. Well, you know, you say there's so many. <laughs> every time in my town, every time a, uh, a storefront in a strip mall or something becomes empty and available, my thought is, wonder what church will be there next. <laughs> But you see, you can know those sin of God. He said, try the spirits. You can know them. And if you don't try the spirits, you don't want to know them. Because those sin of God speak the word of the truth of the gospel, the gospel of your salvation. And for me, one of the chief identifying things of the gospel, the true gospel, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm ready to preach the gospel to Jew or to Gentile. But the gospel is wherein the righteousness of God revealed. Is revealed. And you could go out there and you could you could ask a hundred people if they know anything about the gospel wherein the righteousness of God is revealed. I dare say none of them. Wouldn't have been to church all their life. What? Those who hear the word of God, they don't cherry pick. But they believe the whole revelation of Scripture. And they seek where it's preached. I tell you what, my first wife, well, my after she died, my second wife, I know they they get so tired of me. We can't even go on a vacation when I'm not constantly looking for somewhere I might can hear the gospel. And I'm usually disappointed. They seek where it's preached, not because of who preaches it, not I'm of Apollos and I'm of Cephas. And Paul said, "I didn't save any of you, and neither have you saved anybody, or you, or you, you." It's not how I, I know everybody can't speak this eloquent Eastern North Carolina Flatlander English as good as me. <laughs> one man told me one time, he said, he said, preacher, he said, we can hear faster than that. <laughs> but it's not who says it. It's what said. I remember somebody making a little bit of fun of Brother Scott Richardson and Henry heard it. Henry Mahan heard it. The next service he stood up and he said this. He said, I'd rather hear somebody said that they'd seen something who had seen something than to hear somebody say, I saw something when they hadn't saw anything. <laughs> and that's the way it is I tell you what if you was out in the desert dying of thirst hadn't had water in a week somebody came to you and offered you a 
uh, a drink of water out of an old dirty combat boot, you wouldn't turn it down. It's not the vessel, it's the contents. He tells the truth, the true gospel preacher about God, the truth about man, the truth about Christ, the truth how God saves sinners, not by works of righteousness which he have done, not by not justification based on human works, not sanctification uh, based on man's continuing good, not redemption by any human worth or work, Somebody says, well, I love Christ. But I don't like that message. Christ said, whosoever is ashamed of me and my words, I'll be ashamed of them before my Father and all the holy angels. You can't separate the true Christ from his words. His words are used to sanctify His people. And in short, really, the words that we hear of Christ from the cross upon which all the rest of Scripture is based. One word, really, but in the King James 3 word, His people hear Him say, it is finished. And you believe that. You believe the truth. And believe in the truth. You'll have rest for your soul and peace and joy. We used to sing this little hymn, hymn chorus. He said, Did you hear what Jesus said to me? They're all taken away. They're all taken away. Your sins are pardoned and you are free. They're all taken away. He put them away by the blood of His cross. And all through the Christian life and all that men seek to teach you, you test it with the Word of God. When men say that Christ in some way was a sinner, I say, show me that in the Bible. When they say that men have two natures, I say, show me that. Just show it to me. If you're going to defend it so vehemently and so ferociously, show it to me. You owe it to me if I'm wrong. When they talk about how it works after conversion, progressively make us holy and fit for heaven, I say, God never said that. My beloved never said that. His preachers his apostles, his prophets, they never said that. Let God be true and every man a liar. And when all the afflictions of life come to you, in trial, sickness, whatever it is, It's the Word. Thy Word has comforted me. It's my comfort in my afflictions. When Paul was out on that ship in that famous Eurocladon wind, it took me a long time to learn how to say that. <laughs> And everybody else was afraid. He said, Wherefore, sirs, 
be of good cheer. For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. He said, there's going to be no loss of life, Paul. And that's what we believe when we believe the gospel. We believe what God said, that we shall be saved from wrath through Him. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there's no light in them. So when the gospel is preached, as it was in the book of Acts, as it is every week somewhere in the world, it says, and some believed, and some believed not. The sheep believed. The goats, they didn't believe. We preach and we triumph in every place. I have to read that often. <laughs> he causes us to triumph in every place. When we, when we manifest the sweet fragrance of Christ in the gospel. And we know it's a savor or a fragrance unto life for some. But it's also a fragrance of death unto death to others. Paul said, who's sufficient for these things? But there's one thing for sure, he said. We are not as those that corrupt the Word of God. Father, these that you've given me out of the world, sanctify them, set them apart by the truth. Your word is truth. God bless you. Thank you, Gary.